Chefs Without Restaurants, episode 90 with Matt the Butcher. We walk up this platform and we're looking down into this box. And uh, he's like, all right, man, you ready? And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Like, what, what, what the heck's <laughs> going to happen? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. So he lifts up this huge um, sliding door and this, I mean, it, it had to have been 1,500 pound, you know, cow came in. And I'm like, oh, my God, I don't even remember the last time I've seen a cow up in person, you know. So he takes this uh, modified 22 uh, spring action. It has a, a hollow tip, uh, four inch bolt. So, you know, he clicks the thing, boom. And I mean, it was just the most insane thing I had ever seen. When the professor came up to me and he was like, hey, so what did you think about your day? And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't know what to think about it. Like, I have no idea how to articulate <laughs> what I've just seen, you know? Like, and so he's like, do you want to join the apprenticeship program? And, you know, I was shaking my head no and saying yes. <laughs> yeah. This is the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast with your host, Chris Spear. Each week, I'll be speaking with food entrepreneurs and people in the culinary industry. If you're interested in learning more about our organization dedicated to helping people build and grow their food businesses, look us up on the web at chefswithoutrestaurants.com and .org, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Chefs Without Restaurants. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. I'm your host, Chris Spear. On the show, I have conversations with culinary entrepreneurs and people in the food and beverage industry who took a different route. There are caterers, research chefs, personal chefs, cookbook authors, food truckers, farmers, cottage bakers, and all sorts of culinary renegades. I myself fall into the personal chef category as I started my own personal chef business, Perfect Little Bites, 10 years ago. And while I started working in kitchens in the early 90s, I've literally never worked in a restaurant unless you count the BK Lounge. On this week's episode, we have Matt LeVere. He's been a butcher since 2009 after completing an apprenticeship at the University of Arizona Meat Science and Agricultural Lab in Tucson, Arizona. He spent 40 hours a week for six months learning not only how to slaughter animals humanely, but also how to utilize the whole carcass. Since then, he's worked in Wyoming, Virginia, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Massachusetts, England, and Italy, learning from the best chefs and butchers he could find. Besides learning how to utilize the whole animal through new cutting techniques, he also enjoys curing meat and making charcuterie. He recently started a YouTube channel where he shows people how to make charcuterie at home. And if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, Matt the Butcher meat products can be found at Vignola Gourmet Italian Market in Rockville, Maryland. So on the show, we talk about how he got into butchery after realizing he wasn't going to be a marine biologist like he'd originally hoped. You'll hear stories about his job at an upscale resort and his adventures in Europe. Find out how COVID led him to breaking down meat shares, starting his retail meat business, and launching his YouTube channel. And if you want to continue supporting the Chefs Without Restaurants organization and podcast, we've launched a Patreon, which can be found at patreon.com forward slash chefs without restaurants. Join other patrons like Matt Collins and Justin Kana. And now, time for the show. Thanks so much for listening, and have a great week. Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. How's it going? Excellent. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely, man. It's uh, I've definitely wanted to come on the podcast for for a while now, and thank you for the invite. So I usually kind of jump into your little culinary backstory. So you you've been a butcher since 2009, but what was your relationship with food? I guess growing up, like, were you always into food and cooking? Was it something that you envisioned going into for a career? You know, it wasn't really uh, something I envisioned to to go into, but it was always around me. Uh, my dad was a chef. He graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in uh, 1980. Uh, and then my grandmother, which was his mom, uh, she was, uh, you know, an Italian woman and she cooked like crazy. So many things from scratch. You know, he would drop me off at her house uh, with all my cousins And she would just cook up all types of stuff, Uh, you know, pizza and pasta, uh, sausages, meatballs, her her own bread, fried dough, all this stuff. I mean, it was always available and she would always whip it up like it was second nature. And so, you know, it was I I always had the the smells 
around me, you know, all the classic Italian, like the oregano and all those classic preparations. And my dad, you know, for lunch, he would make all types of, he'd go to this, uh, this market that was down the street from us. Cause I grew up in Connecticut and, uh, he would go and get, you know, mortadella, capicolo, uh, provolone, all these kinds of Italian style deli meats. And he would show us how to make sandwiches. And, uh, that happened so many hundreds of times growing up and you know in in uh in connecticut uh there is like a pretty big italian culture down there uh old school italian culture so there's a, a lot of old school delis and pizzerias and things like that uh which a lot of people who aren't from you know that east coast that northeast coast the new england area they don't know about that stuff but <laughs> It is there. It I grew up in Massachusetts, so like Boston has a pretty strong uh, culture there as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, half my family lives in Massachusetts. Half my family lives in Connecticut. So I, I definitely understand that too. There's, there's a lot of Italian, good Italian in Boston. Uh, yeah, so you know, I, I never really thought uh, that I would be into the food business. Uh, I knew I liked it. I honestly, <laughs> I thought that uh, I was going to be on the Dallas Cowboys, some kind of like um, quarterback or something like that growing up, you know, because my dad was so into sports and uh, he'd always explain the games to me and, you know, tell me who was good and who wasn't good. And when I kind of stopped growing in high school and everyone excelled at, sport, at sports, you know, I realized that probably wasn't going to be the thing. So the next thing I wanted to be was a marine biologist, uh, you know, before I could legally work, I traded my time uh, for store credit at a saltwater aquarium store. And uh, I, I think I was 14, 14 and a half, something like this. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I worked six to eight hours. I don't even know if it was legal or not. Uh, you know, feeding all the fish, cleaning all the fish tanks. Uh, you know, they had these things called um, live rock tanks. And it mm -hmm. was just, you know, I don't know, a ton of like broken pieces of coral that help the, uh, the water filter through and it keeps the balance of all the biology of the water in there. So, you know, if there, if there was stuff floating on top, I had to clean up all that stuff and, you know, just, you know, help shopkeep and things like that. You were staging in a fish shop before that was cool, yeah. right? Yeah. Before that was cool. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Anyway, uh, I think six or seven months went by and I had enough uh, money to buy up a, um, you know, a, a nice uh, fish tank. And then, you know, I, I went, I was back at school and I was take I was trying to take all the, you know, biology classes I could that would kind of relate to biology or like marine biology, that is. And, you know, I just realized that uh, school was not my thing. <laughs> You know, it, it kind of showed in my grades, no matter how hard I tried, uh, you know, I couldn't get to the next level. It took me twice, three times as long to learn certain aspects of stuff, uh, especially mathematics and whatnot than other kids. And, you know, I just get, uh, kept getting pushed back into like the, you know, the special education or the, the help, uh, you know, the, the ones where they, they put the kids where they just don't get anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was becoming apparent you weren't going to be majoring in college in that, huh? Right. Exactly. So I was like, you know, and the only thing I was getting A's in were my art classes, ceramics, drawing, painting. Uh, I love this stuff. And all my teachers through all four years of high school, and I actually ended up taking one year of college. I aced all of those. So that was five years of, uh, you know, art classes I took and I excelled at all that. And, and I became like every single teacher I had, every new teacher I had, you know, they were like, Oh my God, you're like, uh, you're like a sponge. You're just absorbed so much. You have so much creativity. I was like, yeah, but I can't do anything with it because I can't go to school. Like <laughs> I just, I'm horrible at it. So yeah, I took the one year of, um, of community college and I failed all my classes except art. And, uh, so then I was like, you know what? I think I want to start my own, uh, t-shirt brand company. And, you know, I got a screen printer, you know, I was really excited about that, but, you know, buying stock t-shirts that cost money and whatnot. And so I was like, I need to get a job. So my parents are very supportive of it, you know, but they were like, you know, you, you kind of need like, 
you know, a plan B, right? A little like direction maybe. Become, <laughs> yeah, direction. You, until you become like the next Echo Unlimited, you know, uh, you need to find a job. So I was like, all right. And my dad tells me, hey, there's an Italian spot right down the street. It's having its grand opening. They're hiring. Uh, why don't you uh, go and apply? So I go and apply. And, apply, and um, I just tell them straight up. I, I kind of told them what I just told you, right? And they thought, oh, okay. So what do you want to be? A sous chef or something with all that, you know, food experience you have around? I'm like, no, no, no. I'll, I'll be a dishwasher. You know, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a high school kid. You know, I don't want to go up in one ring in the ladder. You know, I want to stay. Uh, you know, come in from the bottom and work my way up kind of thing. And uh, they were like, okay, okay, cool. Nope, no problem. So yeah, I, uh, I started working as a dishwasher in this Italian restaurant and they emphasized big time that they were a scratch kitchen. And I'd never heard that term before, right? Because uh, <laughs> I thought all kitchens were scratch kitchen kitchens, right? I never heard of like a Cisco kitchen or you know, not that they're bad, but I just didn't understand this. And, and I went and I told my dad, like, hey, uh, they say that they're a scratch kitchen over there. And he's like, oh, wow, that's that means it's a really good spot. You know, they're making everything by hand. And so, you know, from there, I met the passion that comes with a scratch kitchen, right? The people, the owner and the chef who are just very passionate about to, uh, passionate about having high, high quality food. Uh, working with high quality food and creating high quality food, putting all the flavor profiles together and things like that. I mean, that just like, that was amazing to me watching them build a plate together, talking about it, you know, needs a little bit more salt, a little more acid, these kinds of things. You know, I'd never seen food be built that way because my dad and my grandmother just whipped it together. Like it was, you know, like it was nothing. And it tasted phenomenal. You know, it was, a, it's a, it was a pizza restaurant, Italian pizza restaurant. And they did have like some saute and grill and things like that and salads and all that was really good. But they emphasized the pizza. Everyone knows them for the pizza. Um, still thriving to this day. That was over 10 years ago now, maybe 11 or 12. Either way. So I was a dishwasher over there and I'm watching and I'm watching. And I kind of start getting promoted, learning how to build the dough. You know, I love working with my hands. Um, and, you know, I'm still watching all the sous chefs and chefs come together, make, uh, you know, make these dishes. And honestly, it was very intense. It was a whole new world for me because, like I said, I'd never seen food being created like that. So it was very overwhelming. Uh, and I, I still didn't know. I, I was like, I really want to do this uh, T-shirt company. Um, you know, I want to make it big. I want to be a multimillionaire kind of thing. <laughs> like what kid doesn't, right? But and then this one prep cook comes in and uh, he kind of changed uh, a lot of things for me because he was super, super cool. Wasn't pretentious at all. Gave me the time of day. He was about 30 years old. I was only like uh, 17 at that time. So, you know, when you get somebody that's been in the industry for quite some time and then they give you the time of day, right? Like 20, 30 minutes, he would talk to me about anything and everything about the industry. And I had tons of questions. And a lot of the sous chefs and chefs would get a little annoyed with me, like just, you know, go back to washing dishes or prepping dough or whatever. Anyway, he was there part time and he was working part time downtown in um, a slaughterhouse. So I actually have to back up real quick. I'm sorry. I was still in high school, right? I did my first two years of high school in Connecticut. And then we moved to Arizona halfway through my high school. So now I'm in the Italian restaurant cooking Italian food in Tucson, Arizona. He was working downtown in a slaughterhouse. And the slaughterhouse was attached to the University of Arizona Meat Science Lab and Agricultural Laboratory. So they had a, an apprenticeship program out of there. So he would come in, you know, I'd be washing dishes and I would say, hey, tell me all about, you know, the slaughterhouse, like what happened today? And he would just tell me the most insane stories, you know, that I never heard of before. Right. And uh, he, he was just like, hey, you know, why don't you shadow me? Why don't you come and, uh, you know, spend a day with me? They have an apprenticeship program. If you like it, I can get you in. I was like, well, OK, yeah, let me uh, let me come see what it's about. Uh, it's a small scale slaughterhouse. So it only slaughtered about 15 head of beef at most. And we go to the first, the first station, right? Where you bring the animal in, you shoot it, and then 
you continue to process it from there. So <laughs> we walk up this platform and we're looking down into this box and uh, he's like, all right, man, you ready? And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Like, well, what, what, what the heck's <laughs> going to happen? For yeah. I, don't, I don't know. So he lifts up this huge um, sliding door and this, I mean, it, it had to have been 1500 pound, you know, cow came in and I'm like, oh my God, I don't even remember the last time I've seen a cow up in person, you know, this close is gigantic. It's huge. And when it's breathing, the steam is literally coming out of its nose because of how cold it is in the slaughterhouse there, you know? And, uh, so he takes this, uh, modified 22, uh, spring action. It has a, a hollow tip, uh, four inch bolt, right? So it's got a spring. And when you shoot it, the bolt just comes out and goes right into its forehead. So you have to put a blank in the back of the, this modified 22 and you have about, a quarter inch size space on the forehead that you have to hit so you know he clicks the thing and boom and i mean it was just the most insane thing i had ever seen 1500 pounds of beef just hitting the floor like that at a it was just that simple it was just that simple i just like i could not believe it you know and and from that point on you know my just my jaw just dropped for the whole day going each station watching everything happen. Like it was, I was, I felt like I was on Mars. You know, I'd never, ever seen anything like that. It was just a very eye opening experience. And, uh, for some reason or another, you know, when the professor came up to me and he was like, Hey, so what did you think about your day? And I was like, I, I don't, I don't know what to think about it. Like, I have no idea how to articulate <laughs> what I just seen, you know, like this is insane. And so he's like, do you want to join the apprenticeship program? And you know, I was shaking my head no and saying yes. <laughs> like, uh, I can't, I can't I, imagine what that's like because I mean, it's, it's two different things to butcher. Like, I've butchered before, but I've never slaughtered. Like, I'm not a hunter. I've never killed anything, you know, besides like, say, lobster or something like that. Like, I've never killed a mammal and had to like freshly butcher. Like, by the time I get it, it's like half a side of an animal, right? But like, this is a totally different thing. Totally different thing. Yeah. And uh, it took a while to get used to. It really, really did. You know, because I was always, you know, we were uh, like a, a pet having family. You know, we always had dogs, cats. Like I said, you know, I took care of all those fish. So it, it definitely was a whole new experience. So I did sign up for the apprenticeship program. And it was uh, six months, um, 600 hours you had to clock in and clock out of. And at the end of the six months, you are a certified whole animal butcher. And then they even get you a HACCP certification. So they teach you all about uh, the mechanical, physical, and biological parts of HACCP. But the course was $1,500, and they give you everything you need. Uh, all your knives, um, boots, you need to wear a helmet, you know, your full, like, uniform that you, it was all white uniform and then the certification, you know, and that's really, really taken me a long way. Uh, and it has paid itself over thousands of times, hundreds of times. I mean, it was such dense information I learned in those six months that I've been able to pull from my whole entire career. So yeah, it was a fantastic opportunity that just kind of landed in my lap. So after I got that certification, I wouldn't say like that, you know, I envisioned myself as this, um, you know, lifetime butcher, I envisioned myself as having a solid plan B because I still wanted to do the, uh, the t-shirts, the t-shirt company. Right. So what ended up happening to kind of switch my passion up was, uh, so in, in the eighties, my dad traveled all over the country and he was the executive chef and chef and sous chefs at all these different resorts all over the country. So like uh, National Park in Wyoming, in uh, Alaska, in Virginia, in Texas. And, you know, it's kind of like six months on, six months off, depending on what kind of resort it is, right? A winter resort, uh, summer resorts, they have these things. And um, that would give him an opportunity to kind of cut clean ties and go to the next spot, you know? And uh, that's how he kind of got to see the whole country. Anyway, so after I was done with, the uh, apprenticeship program graduated and all that he was like hey you know what one of the resorts i worked at 
out in Wyoming, they had a butcher shop in the 80s. You might want to go up there. This would be a great opportunity for you because it would be the first time I'm leaving the house. They take room and board out of your paycheck and they have like a whole employee village. So, and this was in uh, the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And so I called them up and I was like, hey, do you guys still have a butcher shop? Luckily, they were hired. They had one more butcher assistant for the butcher shop there in the resort. So I applied for it. I got it, got all my stuff and bounced. <laughs> uh, you know, because both of my parents traveled heavily when they were in their, you know, teens and, and 20s. So they encouraged me 100% because they know how amazing it was for them. You know, such an eye-opening experience, especially in the 80s, you know, when there wasn't a lot of, you know, social media or, you know, people to reach out to, how to do things, whatever, just traveling and seeing how other people live. That was a gigantic thing for them. Mine, you know, eye-opening, mind-opening um, situation because they're both from small towns. Anyway, so yeah, I went up to uh, Wyoming uh, the first season and Usually there is people from the previous season that will come back from that last year, right? And kind of help things run uh, for a smoother uh, transition. But what ended up happening was it was a brand new crew that year that I got there. So working with those guys, it created such like a, you know, brothership, brotherhood, you know, just going through opening up a resort and closing a resort and all the stuff that's in between it was insane. And there was a lot of passionate chefs, you know, there's a lot, a lot of creativity out there. And the thing is the head butcher that was there, he got a full-time job out in Montana somewhere towards the end of the, the season. And it was like, there was like a month and a half left. And the executive chef pulled me in the office and he was like, Hey, uh, I need you to look over the butcher shop. He's like, I need you to kind of grab the bull by the horns and help me out with inventory, ordering, managing, and all that. And I was like, I had just turned 18. I was like, uh, okay. He was like, look, I'll give you two options. I'll give you the money if you want to be the head butcher, but that tells me you're ready for this and all the responsibility with it. It's like, or I'm going to keep you at your pay right now and I'll help you. I'll help you through the whole uh, rest of the season. So I have some room for error, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a that's a lot of responsibility, though. I mean, at, at 18, because I didn't have any responsibility like that until I was probably like 22 or 23. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, it was a lot of responsibility. But the other guys in the butcher shop were nowhere near, uh, you, you know, they were just cooks that couldn't hang in the kitchen kind of thing. So they were put down in the butcher shop to, you know, portion out five ounce chicken breast or whatever. I was very passionate about butchery. So, you know, I, I had to maintain it and I had no problem with it. Uh, and the chef really, really, really helped me out. So yeah, that, that kind of, I don't know. I, I thought to myself, you know what, I'm actually at the end of the season when everything went okay, everything went well. And he was like, you know, I'm seriously considering bringing you back as the head butcher next year. I was like, Oh my God, maybe this can be a career for me. You know, maybe this can be something I'm good at. I love working with my hands um, there is a lot of creativity in it, you know, further on down the road when I started getting into charcuterie and stuff like that. And so, yeah, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was an amazing opportunity. And, uh, I ended up going back there for two seasons, two more seasons. So three seasons altogether as head butcher and each, uh, season was just amazing. Now, at any point did your dad try to dissuade you? I mean, it sounds like they were very supportive, but you know, chefs, very rarely want their children to go into the food business for whatever reason. Was there any talk about like how hard the food business is being a butcher is very different than say being an executive chef, but what, what was, what did he tell you? Both my parents were very, very supportive, uh, especially of me going into the butchery world because it was a, my dad knows that being a butcher, you can pretty much have a job from coast to coast uh, he's worked with butchers. He's always had a good time with butchers. He's always been thankful for having a butcher on his team because he has one guy that, you know, can kind of look after the proteins. You know, he has a guy that's a lot of for that's passionate. is going to look out for him. As years would go on, he had 
uh, you know, he had been through the ringer. He had 35 years of experience as a chef. And, uh, you know, my passion was, I was obsessive. Like I said, I would, I would work eight hours, 10 hours. Um, and I would go home and read books on butchery, on charcuterie, any content that was out there for uh, butchery. I would, I would read it. I would try to network, you know, when I first started, it was yeah, you know, 2008, 2009, and there was almost nothing online. And I remember working in a butcher shop in Tucson, and uh, one of the guys over the counter was like, "Hey, how'd you get into the butchery or whatever?" And I kind of told him the backstory and whatnot. And he was like, "So, how long are you planning on being a butcher for?" I was like, "Man, as long as I can. You know, I love it." He's like, "Well, dude, don't you know it's a dying trade?" I was like, "Is it?" <laughs> Like, I, I didn't know, but, and then I started asking around and, and everyone was like, oh yeah, man, like 15, 20 years, there's not going to be any more butchers. I'm like, holy crap. Like, what did I just get into? You know? So any little avenue I could find, you know, anything, any content online, I would, I would just absorb it and just try my hardest. Cause I was like, I need to know everything about butchery. So, you know, if I can open up my own shop one day or whatever, uh, I'll have, you know, all the knowledge and, you know, I can kind of help bring back the, the butchery, uh, world, you know? So that, that was, um, in the time frame that I have been a butcher in the last 10 to 12 years, the small butcher shop has definitely, definitely made a resurgence. And right around that time I started is when, you know, a couple people, really started uh, making headlines um, in the food industry, bringing back the small butcher shop and running their own apprenticeship program and things like that and pumping out these butchers into the industry and then them creating their, their butchers, uh, butcher shops and things like that. And it's, I've just seen it grow, grow, grow and build and build, build. So I feel very good about that. I love that. Uh, it's a huge safety net for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, well, most definitely. I think, you know, one of the things is, as now more chefs and even people at home want to use better quality meat, like heritage breed animals, you know, for example, you're not getting that kind of stuff in a traditional grocery store for the most part. I mean, some places like Wegmans and so forth, but like in Frederick, we have common market. So what they're doing is like Autumn Olive Farms, they are delivering whole pigs to the grocery store there and they're butchering them all in house, which is phenomenal because when I was working at a place, if I wanted to use their pork, like the smallest they would send me is a quarter. So it's like, you, you know, you get the whole thing. It's like the ribs and the loin and everything attached. It's like, well, none of my people know how to do this in house. Like it's just not feasible, but now like retail, I can just go in there and grab like two pork chops because they have an in-house butcher who's, who knows how to break it down. And I just think that's better for everyone. So seeing more of these smaller butcher shops and grocery stores being able to butcher in house, I think it's phenomenal. Absolutely. I'm right there with you. I love it. Uh, the meat is phenomenal. Even from, you know, farmer to farmer, you get different, uh, you know, flavors and breeds and everything that comes with that. And you went over to England and Italy and did some work over there. Is that right? Yes, I did. Uh, so <laughs> Right uh, in my third season in Wyoming, remember I told you it's uh, six months on, six months off. So that six month mark came and there was going to be a clean cut. And I had told myself after the uh, second season, I say, if I go back for a third season, I have to save up all my money and I'm going to Europe. So at the beginning of the, that last season, at the very beginning, I bought a, a plane ticket to Heathrow. England. And the plan was to somehow get to Italy. And that's how I kept it for like the first couple of months of the, uh, the season. And I was, and when I was, as I was talking to people, I was like telling them exactly that. They're like, wait, so you're going to England, but you're trying to get over to Italy. You don't have a ticket yet. Or I was like, uh, yeah, I'll figure it out when I get there. They're like, no, dude, <laughs> no, you have to, plan a little bit you have to plan to get over there so I, I was like okay all right let me let me start how can i navigate over there so i thought to myself uh if i send out a ton of emails to butchers in all over europe right maybe they'll let me stage maybe they'll let me stage and i can kind of you know gravitate towards italy and so 
I sent out probably like 50, 60 emails uh, to, you know, the most well-known butchers of each country, like Spain, Germany, England, uh, Italy, France. And I just got just a few replies. I even sent out a bunch of um, emails to different farms just to stay in Europe, you know. And uh, one of the farms was in Italy and they needed a butcher to help them prepare for the winter to slaughter some of their livestock. And so I, I booked that, but that was like a, a month. That was like a month after I got into England. And then I got a email response back from one of the butchers in England, Northern England in Leeds. And they were like, yeah, you can come uh stage with us if you want. I, and I, I took the, uh, the train up to uh, Leeds, England and I met this butcher there and he had won, I think it was 2009, 2010, uh, best butcher in Britain. So I went and worked with him and that was just a whole nother mind blowing experience for me because of how they do things there, all the different types of sausages that they offer. Uh, a huge thing that they were known for was pork pies. I'd never even heard of a pork pie, but it is like, if you can imagine taking the most succulent, delicious muffin and then putting meat into it and making the outside crispy, <laughs> right? Like a pastry. Oh my God. It was insane. I probably gained 10 pounds just eating uh, as many pork pies and all the different variations that I possibly could. It was so incredible. I couldn't believe it. And that was another spot where I was like, I want to work all day. Like I just want to work from the morning, right when they start the bakery for the pork pies to the end where they're scrubbing the floors. And that's what I did. And I, you know, I learned how they did, did things over there. And then, so the month came up and my time to go work on the farm uh, was next. So I did actually buy, they, I think they have a, an airline called Ryan Air that you can purchase plane tickets from, you know, one country to the next. So I ended up getting uh, to Italy pretty easily into Milan and then uh, taking the train all the way to this middle of absolutely nowhere mountain town uh, in the Piedmont region. And uh, you go like 15 miles away to the base of a mountain from the train station. And, uh, and then you go 15 miles up into this mountain range. <laughs> and then the farm was located right on the side of a mountain and I was like, oh my God, where am I? Like I could get lost out here or something could happen and no one will ever, ever, ever find me. The woman that I was in contact with, her name was uh, Katarina and she was a very strong, independent Italian woman and she kind of ran the farm. And, uh, you know, I just basically, was, I was with her from day to day and I would do all these different farm operations, uh, chores, I mean, and you know, her husband at the time would go out from the morning all the way to dusk and with a shotgun and up and down the mountain shooting whatever he could find. <laughs> so there would be many mornings where he would wake me up because they let me stay and obviously let me stay in, in their place. Uh, he'd wake me up and he would tell me, hey, there's a uh, wild boar in the farm for you uh, to go cut up or a deer or something like that. And I would go, I'd, I'd cut it up, and then I would begin my chores. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a wildlife. That sounds like something out of a whole nother age, you know, like definitely not yeah. modern times. Yeah. You know, and the, the older people, they have like what they call like the Etruscan look, you know, very just, you know, old, small Italian men with like overdeveloped shoulders and hands and like facial features and like just, you know, they, they kind of look like mountain men, I guess you would say, you know, and they're very uh, rustic and a lot of cobblestones out there, not many roads um, up in that mountain, uh, like well-paved roads. I mean, oh, and another really cool thing about that farm was they had uh, 15 black horses and they would let the horses just go into the wild for the whole summer. And then as the, uh, the weather would come down, the horses would go from the top of the mountain all the way down to the bottom of the mountain. So 
as she's trying to explain this to me, you know, uh, Katharina, like, oh, we have to go get the horses. I'm like, what do you mean you have to go get the horses? Because I see that they have stables and they're completely empty. She's like, oh, yeah, they're at, they're at the bottom of the mountain. And I'm like, well, how the heck are you going to bring them back up? She's like, well, I'm going to ride them back up <laughs> through the woods. I'm like, are you kidding me? I was like, what? Okay. So then uh, she's like, yeah, you're going to drive me all the way down to the mountain, all the way down to the bottom. I'm going to hop on the horse and then I'll see you in about two hours. And I have to drive it all the way back up with like no GPS or anything. I was like, so stressing out. Like, I hope I don't get lost because text messages took forever to go through. So that's, that's exactly what happened. I took, you know, I, I took the truck, brought her down the mountain. They were there in the middle of a, of a soccer field, some kid's soccer field or whatever, you know, just eating the grass. She hopped on one and brought it right back up the mountain. And, you know, I saw her like an hour and a half later and everything was fine. It was a bareback ride. She, she rode it bareback. Insane. So she rides one horse and then all of them just follow her? Yeah. She knows. And, and that one had like a bell on its neck. So she knew exactly who it was. And that horse knew who she was. And there was no mistake about it. And it was exactly what they do every single year. <laughs> Sounds more interesting than a traditional four-year uh, college education. Yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah. I don't know if you learned those techniques in, in college. <laughs> Now, I have a question about uh, charcuterie. Like, where's the line between butchering and charcuterie? Like, does everyone who butcher get into charcuterie or is that an offshoot? Like, what do you what do you find there? If I can go back to that farm town real quick, in that town, they had what they call the charcutiers, you know, the people who just made salami and just made pâtés and those things. And it was its own storefront. Small little storefront, but it was its own thing. And then they just had the butcher. And both of those guys were those professions their whole life. And that's all they did. So, you know, the charcutier got it from the butcher. And, you know, if the butcher wanted salami, he had to go to that guy. So it was, it was, it was a big separation out there. But here uh, in America, I have found that, you know, there's just so, so much information out there right now that uh, you really can find, you know, butchers that are into charcuterie and salumi and these things uh real heavily and i i see the ones that hang around the most in the charcuterie scene uh are butchers by trade i always see a lot of uh chefs and hobbyists uh come into it and they'll have a pop of interest or whatever um come up with something dabble with it and then kind of go back to you know the quicker things uh cooking, sauteing, grilling, and that kind of stuff, coming up with a full dish instead of charcuterie that takes, you know, up to two years to open up a, uh, a bone in ham or whatever. So yeah, um, that's something you have to learn is the, the time, the patience as uh, somebody that wants to be a professional in curing meats, it takes a long time. And if you mess up, right? So you don't know uh, until like three months or a year later, like, oh my God, I forgot this step. And now the whole inside is completely, you know, rotted or my salt levels are, were completely off. You know, I, the decimal, you know, I moved it over one wrong space and now it's got twice as much salt or not enough or whatever, you know? So you don't find out about those mistakes until way too long, you know? Uh, so that's, that's why I, I find, um, you know, sometimes butchers uh, that get the whole butchery down, the whole butchery part, right? Really learn all the cuts, the best cuts for um, making salami and sausages and things like that are the ones that hang the longest in uh, charcuterie and, and salumi because, you know, the base for all that stuff is in front of them all the time. So when did you get into that and how did you get into that? Because you you do charcuterie. Yes, yes, I definitely do. And I love it. It's absolutely uh, an absolute passion of mine. I got into it the second season I was in Wyoming, actually, because when I came back and I was uh, the head butcher there, you know, I'd gotten enough trust with the chef after about a month and a half, two months into the season where I asked him, uh, you know, can I start doing cure projects and things like that? I had just gotten, uh, I had actually just found out what charcuterie was watching Anthony Bourdain's show, no reservations on, um, Michael Roman and, oh, yeah, yeah. Charcuterie book, mm -hmm. you know, so he did like a whole, uh, 30 minute 
you know, show on, on those guys. And I'd never even heard of like charcuterie or anything like that. And, uh, and so I bought that book and boom, another interest spike interest when I just became obsessed with it, became obsessed. And so when I went to Wyoming, I brought that book with me and I asked the chef like, Hey, can I start doing projects? And he was like, yeah, as long as all your stuff that we've been doing the last two months stays, you know, nice and clean and organized and everything like that, you can do projects. So, yeah, I mean, he let me do anything I wanted with top round of beef, whole chicken and pork butt. So it was pretty much unlimited amount of projects with those things. And man, I, I just worked my way through that whole entire book, you know, just learning how, you know, flavors come together in meat and uh, charcuterie projects and I absolutely oversalted things and overspiced things and mess things up. And, you know, since it was only a pound or two at a time that I would, I would do these projects, you know, the chef didn't mind too much and he would help me too. You know, he would taste it and say, wow, this is absolutely horrible or, uh, <laughs> oh, this one's spot on or whatever. You know what I mean? So, uh, that's when I started getting into it and I started, uh, making salami at my house and hanging it in my closet, not knowing anything about like temperature, humidity parameters or the importance of that stuff. Right. And, uh, just, I just wanted to see how, how it reacted, what would happen, you know, and then eating it, uh, it was similar to the salami I ate growing up and I'm like, Oh my gosh, like maybe I can, you know, keep developing this and, you know, keep buying parts to, uh, to help my charcuterie game, you know, get better sausage stuffers, uh, wine coolers, these kinds of things. Only, you know, being a butcher and only being a butcher in, in restaurants and things like that, there's always scraps of meat and things like that. And I've always had chefs allow me to make things with it and, um, trying to, because a lot of that scrap has already been accounted for in the cost. So if I can come up with anything with it, you know, charcuterie wise, that's just more money. And if I mess it up, then you know, you live and learn kind of thing. So I, I definitely had a lot of chefs give me opportunities to make little things here and there. And then as my recipes uh, and techniques started getting stronger, uh, then I was able to start and run full charcuterie programs in different uh, restaurants. Yeah, I'm definitely a charcuterie rookie, but I did take a three day workshop with uh, Brian Paulson here in the actually it was in Gaithersburg. Uh, and that was a, an amazing experience. And all the DC chefs were there. Like that's where I first met like Kyle Bailey and Anthony Lombardo and like all these guys. Um, it was really interesting to see them and none of them were really butchers by trade. They were all chefs in restaurants. Um, but it was great to kind of have some first hand, you know, experience doing that, but you know, three days, you're not even really, really getting into that much about it. You learn the very basics, but you don't then get to see the spoils of your labor you know we'd make some things there but then i had to leave them and it's like oh well i hope it came out okay yeah no you're definitely right it, it's definitely a got to get your hands in there feel what the the proteins and fats are doing um you got to cook it you got to taste the flavors um yeah it, it takes a you know repetition repetition just like being a good chef you know it takes a, a lot of time to become a good uh, charcutier so what are you doing now? What's your, where are you working? What's your business? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I helped open up a restaurant down in DC that I was working for. And I, it's, uh, it's called Mercy Me, ran by chef Johanna Hellriegel. Uh, she heard about me through a mutual friend and she hit me up and was like, Hey, I, I want to, you know, a butchery and charcuterie program, uh, for the restaurant I'm going to open up. Can you, would you join the team? And at the time I, uh, you know, it was at a perfect time for me to leave the place I was at. And so, uh, yeah, we, we were gearing up for about a month and a half, you know, breaking down beef carcasses and coming up with a, a salumi and salami program and all that. And, uh, two weeks before the grand opening day, there was the shutdown. <laughs> So the shutdown happened, right? Uh, so we never got to open the restaurant until months and months later. And I was pretty much just on unemployment that whole time. But during that time, I think uh, like you were talking with the, the butcher up in, in Baltimore about the bottleneck situation with processors. Uh, I got a bunch of farmers asking me to do meat shares for them, right? 
And it was, it was a lot of money that, you know, they were offering. So I thought maybe I could just open up a business at that point, you know, so I could, they could write that money off as an expense and I can, you know, actually buy some legitimate stuff and, you know, have the business kind of support itself. And I had also had a couple of people ask me to help them with uh, opening up uh, their kitchens, like uh, all the critical control points and standard operating procedures uh, that the health department need for their menu. And uh, I have a lot of experience in that as well, working in so many restaurants and uh, opening up and closing and dealing with the health department for other chefs uh, that I had so much information about that already. So I said, why don't I open up a consulting business here? A butchery consulting business. So that's what I did. And I did a a lot of meat shares. Um, So, you know, a farmer or a a group would approach a certain farmer and uh, give them the money for, you know, the carcass, whether it was a beef, pork or lamb or whatever. And then the, the farmer or the group would pay me. I would cut it up for them, package it and then disperse it to them. And it was, I didn't have to sell any of it. I just got my fee. And they would, you know, they'd get their local proteins uh, that they wanted. And I kind of, you know, we could kind of circumvent the, uh, the bottleneck of the, the uh, which was the processing facilities uh, not being able to cut and wrap uh, carcasses for farmers, but they could still get slaughter dates in. So you could slaughter the animal, get it cleaned, but not cut and packaged because they are, you know, the major, major uh, packaging uh, plants have shut down. So that overflow, uh, went into smaller and medium sized slaughterhouses. Plus a lot of farmers got terrified. Right. And like, what's going to happen? Like, I'm not going to get any slaughter dates or slaughter and package dates. So they basically booked the cut and wrap all the way out, um, about 365 days. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was doing is, um, is these meat shares for people. And, you know, uh, Everyone is just so, so happy about it. And I'm, I love doing it, right? And then, uh, so as I was making these products or cutting, cutting and wrapping and stuff, a lot of my friends are saying, hey, can, can I come buy some pork from you? Can I come buy some lamb or whatever? It's like, oh, I can't really because these are already bought, you know? Uh, it's, it's part of a meat share. So I was working out of my friend's, uh, he has a catering kitchen in Rockville. And in this catering kitchen, he has a small like Italian uh, market up front. And uh, in that market, he sells uh, prepared foods to go like frozen dinners, like lasagna, any of like the quintessential, like Italian American cuisine, you know, and all his flavors and food is on point, but he, he closes at three o'clock. So then from there on, you know, it's just an empty kitchen. So I asked him if I could, you know, come in in there and, you know, do these meat shares and stuff. He's like, yeah, no problem. And then uh, I asked the owner if I could hang up my food license at his place uh, and then sell sausages and, and different cuts of meat and stuff out the front. And he was all for it. Absolutely all for it. So that's what I did. You know, I went through the whole thing with the health department. I had just done that for another uh, restaurant in Virginia, got them passed. So I, I had everything ready and lined up. They came to the inspection. I passed. And uh, so I just been selling sausages right now out of, uh, out of the market. And it's been doing really well and I'm really happy about it. Uh, and we are looking to do an expansion here pretty soon on that, getting another freezer to offer, uh, more products and, and things like that. So sounds like things uh, worked out pretty well. I mean, all things considered with COVID and the shutdown, a lot of people didn't find ways to make it work. So I'm glad to hear that you found a a pivot, right? Like we're all using that term, but it's something you probably wouldn't have gotten into had that not happened, at least not this soon, right? Oh, you're definitely right. You're definitely right. One thing led to the other kind of thing, you know, and it it really, uh, I'm really, really happy about it because I have in the last couple of years had a lot of uh, failed attempts at opening a business with other people and uh, here I am doing it by myself now and asking myself, why didn't I just do this in the first place, <laughs> right? Uh, I'll be honest. I just took the stimulus check that we got and uh, filed for all the stuff that you need to open up a, uh, a small business online, right? Because there's application fees and all that. And uh, we just didn't have 
you know, a large chunk of money to just throw away like that until we got that. And then we were like, Hey, you know, maybe we can do it now. And that's what we did. And now it's just kind of progressed. Well, and not having to go out and find a whole new uh, brick and mortar place on your own and take on a lease in the middle of a pandemic and all that, you know, it sounds like you also walked into a great situation there because that's a huge hurdle is, you know, if you had to find your own place to open your own butcher shop and charcuterie shop, that's, yes. that's quite an yes. investment. You're absolutely right. And uh, I'm, I'm very thankful. I've been friends with that guy for quite some time, maybe close to like five years now. And uh, I, over the years, I had done other meat shares in his restaurant when they were closed. So he knows that I work efficiently and very clean. And uh, I'm very respectful to all his stuff. I try to leave it a little bit better than I found it. You know, maybe detail his slicer or sharpen it or whatever for him. Honestly, I was like a little nervous for about a week or two asking him like, dang, I don't want him to say like, no, you can't do the meat shares anymore or whatever. No, he was like, absolutely get your product. Like you go through the whole health department thing uh, and you get passed, get your products in my store immediately. Like, okay. Shit, okay. That was super cool. Super cool of him to do that to get my start. And then uh, I find out that that's actually how he got his start as well. So he's trying to give that back a little bit and uh, he's helping me out big time. I love that. that the, se the sense of community within the food world. And you've uh, launched a YouTube channel with a bunch of like 30 videos or something on there. How's that going? That was another thing, you know, right during the, uh, during the quarantine, I was like, I don't know what the heck I'm going to be doing with my time here. You know, like I need some kind of creative outlet. I'm going insane. And I, I have wanted to do videos for a very long time, but uh, I think this was a, again, a perfect time. And, uh, you know, I watched a lot of videos on how to start it. And some of the most successful people were saying, start today, start with your iPhone and just go. I was like, uh, okay. I mean, I have an iPhone and you know, we have, uh, what's the, the editing software, free editing software on, on the Mac computer. Or whatever. Oh yeah. And iMovie or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can shoot really good videos on an iPhone. Yeah. And, and the first video we took was, uh, off of my wife's iPhone. So that, that was cool. And so we just wanted to go through the, the process, you know, and, and see if we liked it, see if, you know, creating something on, you know, and clipping it together and, and doing all that was, uh, worth the time. And, uh, I have just had so much fun doing it and, you know, I've gotten a really good response from people and, uh, and I've even had a bunch of people make some of the recipes that I've put out there. And I don't know, it's kind of like, you know, maybe authors of cookbooks, you know, and they just keep pumping out cookbooks because they see a great response and it's like, wow, it's growing. Okay. Let's, let's keep it going and see what's going on here. And, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, YouTubers, uh, that make their money off YouTube, they always press for passive income. Right. And, uh, if I ever get to that point of monetization, uh, for the YouTube content, uh, that would just be another gigantic plus to it and much very much so like like a you know, podcast podcast yeah here. exactly uh i've never looked into like doing podcasts or like what you know what i guess ad revenue right is very similar ad revenue like once you get there so that's something i'm working on right now so anyone who's listening i'm open for sponsorships heck yeah absolutely man yeah so that's kind of you know the videos uh doing the videos that's a lot a lot of fun um and like I said, at the beginning of my career, I wanted to do stuff and try things out. And a lot of chefs were willing um, to let me do it. But sometimes, you know, they would say it's too expensive for this or too expensive for that or getting in a certain ingredient or whatever. And I would just be stuck on that one thing. Like, I really want to try salami or I really want to try whatever. Like, screw it. I'm just going to do it at my house, see what happens. And so all these videos that I've been making are all within my house. And that's how I have really polished so many techniques and recipes by doing it at my house here or wherever I was living. You know, I would just bring this equipment with me. And that has just been gigantic, gigantic learning, kind of teaching myself certain aspects of the game of the charcuterie world and things like that. And then bring it back into the restaurant with a proficient and polished technique or recipe saying, Hey chef, I got this for the charcuterie board. 
let me try it. And he's like, oh, let me look at your recipe and procedure. It's like, boom, here it is. He's like, all right, go ahead and try it. Comes out great, you know, get his trust for the next thing. And then, you know, keeps rolling and rolling. So that's kind of where these videos are coming from is all stuff that I've done in my house and are very doable inside a house. I mean, it's, it's with all kitchen equipment and everything is, I, it's gotta be under 200 bucks. Every piece of equipment that I have, you know, sausage stuffer, uh, even the wine fridge. Um, I got that off Craigslist, uh, for 150 bucks or something like that, you know, uh, to make salami out of. And, uh, those videos are, are coming out very soon. And yeah, you know, making pate, how easy is making pate and, different rillettes and these kinds of things. A lot of people are so intimidated by it. Even reading it in the book is one thing, but seeing how someone can do it in the house just with, you know, simple serving dishes, you know, to make it look nice. People don't know about that. They don't, they don't read about that in the book. So that's kind of my angle a little bit, you know, to uh, set myself apart from the other guys um, because some of these guys have been doing it for years and years and they're just, they're putting out such advanced uh, information. Again, you know, I feel like a lot of people get a little intimidated by that when they're trying to enter the world. And I think those are the kind of people that I'm uh, gearing towards is uh, the people that are hobbyists or just trying to get into it, you know, an easy recipe for this, easy recipe for that with some advanced stuff coming down the line. But I've just had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, I remember uh, I taught myself how to butcher a pig's head. Chris Cosentino has like an eight part video series on YouTube that's probably like 10 years old. I'd have to go back and watch it. So the video quality isn't there. I don't know why it's in eight parts. Maybe there was like a maximum upload file size or time like way back in the old days of YouTube. But I bought a pig's head from work and brought it home, you know, in a trash bag. And my wife is like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know, like Chris Cosentino did this great video of like how to butcher a pig's head in like one part, you know, it's like all, so you just debone the whole thing and then it's all there with the meat still attached to the skin. I'm like, I'm going to try this. So I just threw it on the island in my kitchen and uh, yeah, and went to town. And that was the first time I ever did a pig's head and I did it at home. That's amazing. And see, uh, so many people just won't do that. (laughs) They just, you know, they won't have the guts or, you know, to take on a project like that, you know, and, uh, you're creative, creative enough. And, um, I, it just, it just have to get over that hump to just try and do things. And I, that's what I've seen a lot of people in the culinary world. Uh, you know, they look at something online and just say, it's just a little too intimidating. And I don't know, I, I didn't watch those, uh, those videos of Chris doing that, but I mean, I can imagine, butchering a pig's head, it's not as easy as, it's just not easy. It's super bony and all this and that. If you don't have the knife skills, you know, you could really, I guess you could mess it up. So maybe that's what people. It was a little hacked, but uh, you know, you, you figure it out. Anything that's left on the bone, you know, then you just boil the whole skull and all the meat that comes off, then you do something else with it. You know, you got to start somewhere and they're, they're yes. cheap. I mean, that's the other thing is they're very inexpensive, even if you're getting them from a fantastic farm that's raising like heritage breed pigs, like a pig's head is still dirt cheap compared to most cuts. So it's like, oh, wow, you didn't do a fantastic job butchering it. Big deal. What was it like 30 bucks, you know? Good for you doing that. So do you have any final words of advice for anyone who maybe wants to, let's say, get into entry-level butchering or charcuterie maybe as a hobbyist not as a professional besides just like getting in there and doing it you know like i said uh, i mean i'm still obsessed with butchery but when i was when i didn't have a wife and kid and i could just drop everything and go somewhere networking i would say definitely networking like going to if you're not into social media which you know listening to a podcast you probably have some form of social media other than just podcasts right i would definitely say try to find butchers in your local area that have a social media presence. Cause usually those people are uh, open and willing to uh, let you hang around the room and kind of get a feel for what they do. You know, if you want to shadow somebody for a couple hours or whatever, I would definitely say um, go to like farmer's markets when maybe they're more in the springtime, maybe when they're more uh, thriving and talk to farmers and a lot, a lot, a lot of farmers, have uh farm slaughters and you know you see everything from the live animal you know being slaughtered and processed all the way to you know sausages and it's all usually done within a day 
And uh, those farm slaughters that I've gone to and even uh, have led usually, and they're usually early spring or in uh, fall, late fall time, you know, so the weather is nice and cold. People are just blown away, kind of like how I was blown away that first time I went to the slaughterhouse in Tucson, right? But then they just want to get their hands in, you know, and it's, it's that day, they're focused on it for that day, you know, they kind of get their fill, they kind of, after, you know, weeks have gone by, they've kind of digested what, have ha- what happened and, you know, they think about it and uh, whether they want to keep pursuing it or not and just, just keep, you know, tacking away, try to ask if you can, this is, this is always a good uh, way of saying stage, right? Uh, when I was in Europe, because it's illegal to work with anybody, right? You can't say, oh, hey, can I work with you for a week or whatever? I would say, can I observe a day of butchery? <laughs> and they say, observe? Yeah, okay, sure, yeah, yeah, you can observe. And then I would say, hey, let me let me get a knife. I want to help. And they're like, well, you're here, so why not, you know? So, uh, you know, just you want to be uh, gradual and, and uh, you know, ask them, you know, politely, and can I come and observe a day? you know, in a local butcher shop or even a, um, like a common market type deal, you know, I'm sure they would let somebody for a couple hours go back and see like the, the breakdown of pigs or something like that. I I would say that start with that kind of thing. Uh, if you don't want to buy a pig's head, for example, and kind of bang it out on your kitchen Island, um, you know, you want a little bit more instruction, learn how to, um, trim up trim, for instance, take out glands and hair follicles or whatever, uh, that, that place is doing, you know, you just learn how to hold a knife, get some volume in. And, uh, I would say definitely ask a local butcher shop or a local meat department. If you could, uh, you know, hang. Do you have any good, uh, book, book references for butchering? I mean, I know there's a ton out there and I have a bunch of different ones. Do you have like a go-to or something you'd recommend? It is really difficult (laughs) You can read about it and see, I have, I mean, probably close to I don't know, 80 books on, on meat and, you know, they're all different kind of genres. Like I have one book that's just on fat, so many books on charcuterie, books on uh, raising beef and then just butchery books. You know, you d- it's hard, man. It's hard. It's hard to read it in a book, but I would definitely say, uh, I would say The Art of Beef Cutting by Carrie Underly is a really good one. She was uh, an early on inspiration to me. And I bought this book and I, I learned a lot. We actually kept it in the kitchen I worked at. Like one of my sous chefs got it for Christmas present and brought it in and he just kept it in the restaurant. Oh, beautiful. Okay. So you know how beautiful this book is, like all the photography yeah. and the knowledge. She is so incredibly knowledgeable. Like she knows all the scientific names for all the, the muscles. I never learned any of that, maybe like one or two, but and then uh, she has all the names for, you know, how to order it from a meat purveyor if you're a chef or something like that. And then pictures of all the meat, how to cook it and cut it and all that. I mean, it's a great book. It's a great, great book. Other than that, I mean, other books are going to be similar to this one as in terms of breaking it down. Uh, but I think hers is super thorough. She even has how to uh, do a yield test with it, right, down to whoever's working on it and what their salary is. Is. So I would definitely recommend that one. And again, that's The Art of Beef Cutting by Carrie Underly, one badass female butcher. Amazing. Yeah. I uh, I usually put lists of resources in the show notes. So I'll put that there with some of the others as I go through my books. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Where can people find you? Again, that'll be in the show notes. But if people wanted to follow you online, what are your favorite places to interact with people? I am on Instagram the most, right? I do my store. I do like daily stories, uh, you know, just of what's happening in my life. And that could be anything from what I'm eating, playing with my, my boy or, uh, cutting up meat or making salami. Like it's just the day in the life of me. And sometimes there are no stories or, and sometimes there's like a million little dots, you know, going, you know, I'll do it on Instagram first and post, and then I'll, I'll usually just send that same exact thing over to Facebook because I have a lot of longtime followers on Facebook that are on Instagram. So I would ju- definitely say, uh, you know, Matt Levere at, at, or at Matt Levere for Instagram or Matt the Butcher. If you just type in Matt the Butcher, I've kind of taken over that name on the internet right now. Nice. Uh, way to, way to go see. with the branding. 
Oh yeah, exactly. You know, that was another thing uh, when I, when Marilyn was like, okay, what's your, what's your name for your business? And I'm like, Matt, the butcher, I, I don't, I don't know. And I just typed it in, you know, I was like, no one's going to see this, you know, it was just for the consulting, you know, type deal. And then uh, it actually turned into something. So I was just like, Oh, you know, it's easy to remember Matt, the butcher, I'll just keep it. And you know, it, it's, it's my face, it's my name, you know, connected to it. And uh, I kind of like it, you know, I've, that's why I've always been called that Matt, the butcher, you know, all my friends, that's how they identify me. So it's like, all right, I'll just stick with that then. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on the show. I appreciate having you. Absolutely. This is great. And once again, you're a great conversationist and, uh, and uh, I can't wait to see your podcast. Keep growing, man. You have some awesome guests, awesome interviews. So thanks again for coming on the show. And to all of our listeners, this has been Chris with the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. As always, you can find us at chefswithoutrestaurants.com and .org and on all social media platforms. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. And if you're interested in being a guest on the show or sponsoring a show, please let us know. We can be reached at chefswithoutrestaurants at gmail.com. Thanks so much.